Thank you. You understand what PAVE means? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I'm the, uh, there's been four speakers and it's the World Series in the States, so I'm the cleanup hitter tonight or this afternoon. But um, what I'll try to do is wrap, wrap it up. Okay, thank you. What I'll try to do is uh, wrap the presentations together and bring it all together and uh, as the cleanup hitter, right? Pull it together and show where we're, where we're going in the future with this smart aquaculture. So it was rather fast paced these last two, three sessions. So I'll a little bit slow pitch it here and to give you the overall concept of what we're doing with smart aquaculture and some of the issues, the fishery management, marine fisheries, capture fisheries, some of their issues, and why we're moving towards an aquaculture, smart aquaculture program. Well, first I gotta figure out the clicker. Oh. All right. Our, as our previous two speakers presented, there's some basic system components to an RAS, right? There's the tanks, we have to move the water, we have to remove the solids, we have biological filtration for the ammonia removal, we have to control our gases, which is our CO2, the respiration of the fish, and we have to make sure there's adequate oxygen in the water for the fish. Then there's disinfection and temperature control. Okay, when we start with the tanks, there's several types of tanks. They're either round, like you saw in some of Henrik's presentation, or they're raceways like you saw in Mr. Hahn's presentation, right? Most of the tanks are fiberglass, but they can be poly tanks or cement or even plastic line tanks. And the drain design, like you see in these round tanks here, there's usually a single drain in the middle and a side drain on the side of the tank towards the top. And then there's certain ratios that we work with as engineers. We work with a width to height ratio in designing these tanks, or we work with a length to width ratio with designing of uh, raceways. Of course, there's multiple ways to move the water. We can move it by using air, so we can airlift it, or use air to pump the water up and move it around the tank or down the tank. Uh, or we can use low head, high flow pumps that have a programmable variable frequency drive to get um, make it more efficient and less costly. Or we have submersible axial flow pumps. So these are a few ways of moving water in and out and around a tank. Of course, we had uh, Mr. Heinrich describe his drum filters for solids removal. Um, well, for fine solids removal, we use protein skimmers, which I'm sure many people have seen on their fish tanks at home or in aquariums, where they get that display quality water. They use the foam fractionators to remove the fine solids. And as Mr. Hahn presented, but he, I don't think he got a chance to talk about it, was using ozone with the foam fractionators or the protein skimmers to help remove those fine solids and keep that water display clear. It's also very healthy for the fish. And other methods of removing solids include radio flow separators, uh, swirl separators for your larger particles, and then your drum, sand, or bead filters for your slightly smaller particles, your medium range particles, you know, under 500 to 50 microns, and then of course protein skimmers for your very fine particles under 50 microns. Then secondly, we have ammonia removal, right? And so, like you saw in both the presentations, uh, Mr. Hans and Mr. Heinrichs, the moving bed reactors, but there's other things besides moving bed reactors. So you can use rotating biological contactors, you can use trickling towers, I, Mr. Heinrich had some of those in his presentation, and you can use sand and bead filters. 
And then when we look at aeration and adding oxygen to the water, we have aeration columns, we have diffusers, there's many types of diffusers. We have oxygen cones, which delivers oxygen in a pressured situation. And then we have under low head, where it's not high pressure, we have low head oxygenators. And of course, we had some very, very nice photos, especially at the end of Mr. Heinrich's presentation and in Jung Ho's presentation of monitoring and control situations. The, I forget what it's called, the Cabela? Capelia. Okay, and then finally, part of a recirculating aquaculture system involves solids capture, dewatering those solids, reclaiming the water and reusing it, and then maybe using the, the dewatered solids for a fertilizer. So why are we talking about smart aquaculture, right? This is where we tie our presentations together, right? We're, we're, we've got a world population increase, and we've heard this from our keynote speaker. We heard this from uh, Dr. Zhang. We've heard it in all our presentations, world populations increasing. And with that, we have uh, standard of living increasing. You put those two together, and you get an increased demand for seafood. And like uh, Dr. Zhang's pres uh, slide, where he showed, let me see, we have an increase in population. We're about seven and a half billion now, right? And our food projection, our food supply is increasing. And how are we going to meet that food supply? Well, some of the issues we have here with meeting this food supply is what we have is what we call uh, what an overshoot, meaning that our res we're using our resources faster than we can replenish them. Okay, so in the U.S., uh, you know, we're overshooting our resources by March 15th. And in Korea, it's April 10th. So in terms of the resources we need in the states to sustain our li uh, standard of living, we need approximately five Earths to sustain our standard of living. And here in Korea, you all need about four Earths to sustain your, your quality of living. Overall, globally, we need about 1.75 Earths to sustain our quality of living. Now, we can't keep going on like that forever because eventually we're going to run out of resources. So, you know, we've been living like this for almost 50 years, over or 40 years, over 40 years, ever since 1970s. And this year, our overshoot day was July 29th globally, so that's been the earliest it's been in the last 40 years. So when we look at our global capacity, okay, we use a term global hectares, right? And so our global biocapacity per person is 1.3 global hectares per person. In the U.S., we're using four global hectares. Korea, where you're using about 0.7. Okay, so as we can see that blue line, our world population is increasing, right? And our footprint is increasing, and we're well above our biocapacity level. And we have been, like I've stated in the previous slide, for over 40 years. Okay, so our population is going to increase, and so by 2050, we're, we'll have almost 10 billion people on this planet. And how are we going to meet that food supply, right? There's going to be, by the mid-century, we're going to have to increase our food supply by over 50%. And 75% of that is nearly going to be animal-based food supply. So how do we meet that? And this is why we're talking about smart aquaculture today. 
And we want to be able to do this, of course, sustainably, right? Which we've all seen different definitions as what sustainability is, but we're looking at, you know, the planet, the prosperity, the economic prosperity of the planet, and the social, the, the people on the planet. And we want to combine all of those so that everybody is, everything is sustainable and there's resources for future generations. Okay, so uh, Dr. Zhang alluded to the sustainable goal number 14, which is life below water, right? And really, sustainable goal 14 is really for marine conservation, marine capture fisheries, and Dr. Zhang gave a nice presentation on the sustainability and the problems involved with maintaining a capture fisheries program. And and uh, in my in some future slides and the slide that Dr. Zhang's presented that that capture fisheries is at its capacity. I believe he used a number like 97 percent. We're at or 95. So we don't have room to move with capture fisheries in feeding in supplying that future food supply. So this again is why we're looking at aquaculture. So if you look at the global seafood consumption um, in 2012, 49% of it was provided by aquaculture. But by 2030, over 62% will be provided by aquaculture. And if you look at the uh, fish farming and the capture fisheries, in 50 years, we went from 34, 35 metric tons to 90 metric tons. And in Dr. Zhang's side, slide, this is 2016. I think he had a 2017 slide up there that showed it was down to 82 metric tons. So it's not increasing. It's right in that level, somewhere between 85 and 95 metric tons per year. And But you look at the growth in aquaculture, and in the last 50 years, we went from two metric or two metric tons, or is it two metric tons to over 80 uh, metric tons per, or built million tons per year. So aquaculture has really grown in the last 50 years, and our consumption has increased from 10 grams to over 20 grams or 20 kilos per person. So when we look at advancing aquaculture production, we want to be able to do it sustainably with recirculating aquaculture technology. And from, from both our speakers, uh, we've, we heard how you can, you, you can increase production by controlling the system. You have minimal water use, right? Um, Mr. Heinrich presented a very nice slide how the trout farms went from, what, 40 cubic meters of water initially down to, was it two cubic meters of water per kilogram of production? So that's kind of where we're headed, is reduce that water demand on the system. And we've increased our density. So we've gone from maybe, um, what, 10 kilos per cubic meter up to 60, 80 kilograms per cubic meter using recirculating technology. Right? We've increased biosecurity. We have year-round growing season. We pretty much can locate anywhere, and we have no limit on our species of selection. And I think what fish is going to be more important because I think 60% of all the food fish will come from aquaculture in the future, and the feed conversion ratio for uh, you know, a, a kilogram of feed for a kilogram of fish is much more efficient than any other uh, land animal production, including chicken, swine, and cattle. So it will be in the future an important food source and an efficient protein source. So is aquaculture the only solution? Well, I, no, it's not, but it is part of the solution. And as you can see, uh, Dr. Zhang had this same slide up there, and for the past 40 years, capture fisheries hasn't increased. So we're at the max 
for our captured fisheries, marine fisheries, and the rest of our food fish is going to have to come from aquaculture. And especially when we're moving you know, to the future and we have an extra two billion people, three billion people to feed in the future. So can RAS sustainably intensify aquaculture production? I believe it can, but we have to overcome some basic constraints and that we have to develop alternatives to fish meal and fish oil in the feeds. We have to expand our breeding efforts to improve our feed conversion ratios, to improve our growth rates and to reduce disease. We have to advance our diagnostics and develop vaccines so we reduce the risk of disease and the use of antibiotics. Uh, and like Mr. Hahn said, we have to have some pilot scale systems out there so that we can train the personnel to manage these systems. And we have to increase our investment in the technology and in the technology transfer. And that's all I have. I think I cut ourselves short. I hope I hit a home run here. I hope I clarified it, slowed it down a little bit, and <laughs> slow pitched it to everybody and gave everybody an understanding of what RAS technology is about. And thank you so much for the opportunity.